Okay, so aloha everyone. Uh, happy December 21st, 2020. Uh, it is also the winter stol solstice and the um, Jupiter and Saturn um, great Christmas star. I'm blanking on the term, but you know. So anyway, so so welcome everybody. Thank you and um, and happy holidays to to many of you who have such festive um, real attire um, or 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 uh, filters uh, or backgrounds or or whatnot. So uh, we have a lot of folks um, on the call still joining us. Uh, we have uh, folks from all over uh, Jabsom as well as UHP, uh, as well as some of our colleagues from UH Manoa and the UH system. And so I wanted to uh, welcome uh, all of you. Uh, and, um, and so what we'll do is we'll start off with Dr. Uh, Sandra Chang, uh, and then I will uh, follow up with the next part. Uh, and then uh, we'll leave some time uh, for questions and answers as we know that there are uh, many, many questions, and um, we'll try to answer as best as we can as the information is, is evolving. Um, what is showing on the screen is actually the hawaiicovid19.com slash vaccine page. Uh, this is and will be continue to be the repository of uh, information um, as, as it rolls out, um, uh, FAQs and, and kind of other things. So uh, definitely suggest uh, bookmarking this. And um, also a note tomorrow, uh, there is an informational session uh, for independent and allied health uh, practitioners primarily, but it's certainly, um, uh, you know, any, any, uh, any, uh, any of us are able to attend, you just have to register. Okay, so I will stop sharing. And then just some housekeeping things. Again, this is being recorded. And so if I could just ask you to uh, turn off your video and to mute. Um, and then when Dr. Chang is speaking, she'll have her video uh, and, and obviously the microphone on. Uh, and she will be giving us uh, the science and the safety and efficacy. And then when I speak, I will have my video on and the microphone on. And then I will be uh, speaking about the prioritization and allocation uh, and, and some of the logistics. Uh, and, then, and then we'll go ahead and, and open up afterwards. Okay, so uh, Dr. Chang, go ahead, uh, please. Uh, thanks everyone. Okay, let me share my screen and So hopefully you can see that. Yep. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. So um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I was invited to uh, speak to the medical school and to others on this call about the safety and efficacy of the um, the new vaccines that we have just uh, EOA approval for for COVID nineteen. And so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going over uh, the data that was presented and approved by the FDA for EUA um, use. So um, before I get started, I just wanted to recognize that I'm part of a um, Department of Health Medical Advisory Group. Uh, and I'm a co-chair of that group with Stephen Hankins who is the Public Health and Medical Services uh, officer uh, for HIEMA uh, leading the efforts to roll this vaccine program out. Um, and our mission as part of the med medical advisory group is to provide information to uh, healthcare workers and to the general community uh, about these new vaccines uh, so that they can make informed um, decisions about the vaccine and also provide information to their uh, patients. So as you may know, there are many, many vaccines under development for uh, COVID-19, and they include a wide range of vaccine platforms that are shown here. Some are um, the more traditional inactivated or attenuated viruses. And then uh, we have the newer approaches that involve 
viral vectors, nucleic acid-based um, vaccines, as well as protein-based vaccines. Today, I'll be focusing on the RNA vaccines that have recently be been approved um, for COVID-19. Okay, so before I get started, um, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time going over the background for this technology. It's a new technology for vaccines and involves the uh, production of proteins uh, corresponding to the viral spike protein. So we start out with the virus and um, the gene for the spike protein was cloned and sequenced and a messenger RNA molecules was synthesized uh, for the spike protein and then encapsulated in a lipid nanoparticle for use as a vaccine. Um, this was injected or will be injected uh, intramuscularly and uh, will enter uh, fuse with cells and be expressed by these cells uh, as the protein on the surface. Uh, the spike protein on the surface of these cells and mostly it's antigen presenting cells or dendritic cells that stimulate the immune response. Um, they will be uh, recognized by T cells as well as B cells and lead to the production of antibodies as well as a cell mediated immune response to the spike protein. So just to give you a very quick overview uh, for these two vaccines, uh, on the left we have the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine and on the right the Moderna vaccine. Uh, both of them use messenger RNA uh, platforms. Uh, the timing is a little different. For the Pfizer vaccine, it's given in two doses, which are 21 days apart. For the Moderna vaccine, uh, two doses, 28 days apart. So the timing is slightly different for the two vaccines. In both cases, the trials began in July 27, 2020. And to summarize, um, both vaccines are fairly well tolerated with moderate, mild to moderate side effects that resolve pretty quickly after vaccination. In terms of efficacy, the Pfizer vaccine uh, was shown to be 95% effective uh, with a total of 170 confirmed COVID cases in the study. Uh, in the case of the Moderna vaccine, uh, it was 94.1 effective with 196 confirmed cases in that particular study. The Pfizer vaccine received its approval on December 10th and uh, Pfizer is anticipating submitting for full approval uh, to the FDA in the second quarter of 2021. Uh, in the case of the Moderna vaccine, very recently on December 17th, it received its um, EUA approval uh, I'm sorry, it was reviewed on the 17th and it was approved on the 18th. So one of the first things that they um, intended to do for these vaccine trials was to assure that there was representation of diverse ethnicities and uh, risk groups in uh, age groups in the study population. So here just, uh, we see a summary of the distribution of different ethnic groups. And as you can see, there's representation of uh, the, the full range of ethnic groups in the US, as well as uh, the range of ages, including the high risk ages. So the ages range, um, well, actually from 18 to 85 years of age, and then also um, uh, over 65 years of age to look at the more elderly population. So I'm gonna go over the Pfizer uh, results first, but before going into the results, I just wanted to make the point that uh, the reason why it's been possible to deliver the vaccine soon after EUA approval was because there was parallel uh, um, focus on both the evaluation of the safety and efficacy of these vaccines, along with the manufacturing of these vaccines. So there was a big investment in terms of the government to support the development of these vaccines. Okay. So for the Pfizer um, trial, uh, 
the vaccine was delivered intramuscularly, uh, 21 days apart for two doses. There were 44,000 study participants. Um, for most of the trials, uh, the participants were the adult group greater than 18 years of age. Uh, as they moved along, they included children ages 16 to 17 years of age, and then more recently, um, children ages 12 to 15 years of age. The data that was submitted for approval was primarily in the 16 um, and greater than 18 year age groups. The trial was separated 50-50 into the vaccine and placebo groups. And the primary efficacy endpoint for this particular trial was confirmed COVID-19 seven days after the second dose to the end of the study. And they looked at individuals without previous infection as well as some with or without previous infection. Confirmed COVID for this particular trial was acute respiratory illness and a positive nucleic acid amplification test for SARS-CoV-2. Um, the endpoint that they were seeking was 164 cases of confirmed COVID-19 for an efficacy, a true efficacy rate of 60%. They also looked at secondary efficacy endpoints, which includes confirmed COVID from 14 days after the second dose, as well as severe COVID and COVID as defined by a broader CDC defined definition. This is a summary of the efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine. As I already mentioned, um, it had an efficacy rate of 95% against confirmed COVID. Um, and this was for individuals with or without prior COVID infection. When they looked at the population over 65 years of age, the efficacy was 94%, so still very high. Uh, in general, it was consistent in, across age, gender, race, and ethnicity, although they need to co continue collect, to collect data on these subgroups over the full two-year study period. In terms of the secondary objective analysis, they were able to demonstrate efficacy against severe COVID-19, as you can see, and also um, some efficacy in preventing COVID-19 after the first dose. There was efficacy in preventing COVID-19 in individuals with prior uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, the secondary objectives, because they involve smaller subgroups, will need more data to uh, have a very firm uh, statistical significance. So in terms of safety, they followed the participants for a median of two months after the second dose and looked at both solicited safety data as well as unsolicited safety data in different subgroups. And they found that in general, the vaccine was well tolerated with most solicited adverse effects resolving shortly after vaccination, that is within two to three days. Most commonly, um, they saw injection site reactions, fatigue, headache, muscle pain, chills, joint pain, and fever. Uh, there were a few grade three adverse effects that prevented daily routine activity, and this was primarily fatigue and headache. Uh, interestingly, older adults uh, over 55 years of age reported fewer and milder adverse effects following vaccination. Uh, they did see a few cases of lymph adenopathy and Bell's palsy, and they will continue to uh, carry out surveillance for these um, types of side effects. Um, so again, similar to the efficacy, the safety profile was very similar across age groups, genders, ethnic and racial groups, participants with or without medical comorbidities, and with or without evidence of prior COVID-2 infection at enrollment. Um, and they will continue collect, to collect data for the remainder of the two-year study. So the bottom line is that the U.S. safety milestones were achieved for the EUA. In the case of the Moderna trial, um, there were 30,000 study participants. The participants in this trial were uh, only adults, 18 years of age or older, uh, and they broke them down into different age subgroups with or without a uh, risk of complications. Their definition of COVID-19 uh, uh, was um, 
at least two defined systemic systems, or at least one uh, respiratory symptoms associated with uh, COVID-19. And finally, a positive uh, nucleic acid test. And uh, the outcome was measured 14 days, COVID-19 cases, 14 days after the second dose. So this is a summary of their trial. And um, there was a little bit of a difference in their study design. Uh, they collected blood samples as well as uh, pharyngeal, um, nasal pharyngeal swabs uh, for the after the uh, right before the first dose and before the second dose, and they continue to collect blood samples uh, to serologically test for infection over the course of the study, as well as to do immunological studies. So their secondary efficacy outcomes uh, again included severe COVID nineteen. They were also looking for serologically confirmed SARS-CoV infection with or without symptoms um, and use a secondary definition of symptoms similar to the previous to the other study. Uh, they looked for death caused by COVID-19, uh, COVID-19 after the first dose of vaccine, asymptomatic SARS-CoV infection, and COVID-19 cases regardless of prior SARS-CoV-2 infection. So the results of this study uh, showed an overall vaccine efficacy rate of 94.1% against confirmed COVID-19. Um, when you break down the subgroups, the efficacy for uh, individuals 65 years of older was 86.4%. Uh, for confirmed COVID-19 in participants at high risk for severe disease, efficacy was 90.9% and was similar across age, race, ethnicity, gender, and um, other demographics. When they look at severe COVID cases, um, they had 30 cases of severe COVID-19 in the placebo group, but no cases of severe COVID-19 in the vaccinated group. Um, and this particular study was able to provide preliminary evidence per, for prevention of asymptomatic infection uh, after the first dose. So these were um, the result of swabs taken prior to the second injection in healthy asymptomatic participants in the study. And as you can see, there was a difference. Um, there were 38 uh, cases of uh, COVID-19 in. Uh, asymptomatic uh, COVID-19 infection in the placebo and only 14 in the vaccine group. Um, they will continue to monitor for asymptomatic infection throughout the rest of the study, uh, primarily looking at uh, seroconversion to reactivity with the nucleocapsid antigen. But those uh, data are not yet available. In terms of safety, uh, again, the solicited adverse effects indicated well-tolerated uh, uh, responses to the vaccine. Uh, the majority of adverse events were mild or moderate in severity. Uh, for the first dose, there was injection site pain and lymph adenopathy. Uh, in the case of the second dose, uh, there was fatigue, myalgia, arthralgia, fever, headache, chills, nausea and vomiting, uh, lymph adenopathy, pain, uh, and redness at the injection site. Uh, there were some um, grade three adverse effects, but these were also uh, short-lived. So for the Moderna vaccine, the safety milestones were also achieved. There were no anaphylactic or severe hypersensitivity reactions uh, that were uh, closely related in time to the vaccination. However, they're going to continue monitoring for severe allergic reactions during the public vaccination campaign, as you know, because of the um, occurrence of a few reactions uh, uh, since the vaccine has been introduced. The Moderna study did report animal, uh, the results of an animal study on developmental and perinatal reproductive toxicity and found no adverse effects on female reproduction, uh, development of the fetus or postnatal developmental effects. 
They did note a small number of cases of Bell's palsy and lymph node swelling. And so this will also be monitored with more widespread use of the vaccine. Um, I wanted to point out that both companies will continue safety and efficacy data for the full two years of the study. Um, and also there is going to be very close follow-up uh, for reports of anaphylaxis uh, for the reasons that I show here of cases um, observed both in the US and the UK. So there are still questions that remain. Um, how long will protection by the vaccine last? We still don't know. Um, will the vaccine prevent against asymptomatic SARS-CoV infection? There's preliminary data supporting that from the Moderna trial, um, but we need more data uh, to confirm this. Uh, will vaccination reduce uh, COVID-19 transmission? That is another important question. Um, are two vaccine doses required for protection or can protection be achieved with a single vaccine dose? There was a hint that there was uh, protection after the single vaccine dose if you follow the survival curves for both trials. Um, but it may be necessary for the two doses to get very good long-term memory to the um, vaccine. Is the vaccine safe and effective in children 12 to 15 years of age? Uh, that's still being studied. And in pregnant or lactating women, uh, they were not included in this study and those studies are still in progress. Um, there are bridging studies under consideration to demonstrate safety as well as immunogenicity in young children younger than the age of 12 and pregnant and lactating women. Um, for follow-up, there are a number of different approaches. In addition to the companies also following up on the um, safety of the vaccines, there will be an active surveillance uh, for safety using a vSafe app that's illustrated here uh, that's being rolled out by the CDC that allows you to um, check your health and report your health after vaccination, as well as receive reminders for subsequent vaccine dates. Um, there will be passive surveillance using the VAERS uh, vaccine adverse event reporting system, uh, as well as individual case consults and large linked database monitoring for safety. Um, so I just wanted to conclude that, you know, we still need to follow the tried and true approaches for uh, protecting ourselves against COVID-19, including wearing a mask, staying six feet apart, avoiding crowds, and not shown here, washing your hands. And then finally, the new option, which is get vaccinated when it's your turn. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Chang. Um, so we just have a couple of minutes to uh, see if there are any burning questions about uh, safety or efficacy. Uh, again, as Dr. Chang shared, there's still a lot of questions to be further, uh, or answers to be further elucidated uh, with the, um, you know, with the subsequent trials uh, in the trial population as well as in the general population as more vaccine rolls out around the world. Uh, but if there's any burning questions, we can take one or two and then I'll put the rest into the chat and then I'll go into my uh, discussion and then we'll come back for questions. Okay, great. Okay, so we do one, have one. one. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So the question is, could you please elaborate on this two-dose regimen and what is different? Um, the dose regimen uh, is defined by the conditions of the clinical trial itself. That is when the clinical trial was done for Pfizer, it was a 21 day um, dose schedule. In the case of Moderna, it was a 28 day dose schedule. So generally the practice is to follow the same dose schedules as were done for the trials because you know, those are defined as the conditions under which the vaccine were, was effective. There is a little bit of a leeway, I believe a four day window um, for each of these vaccines. So you can get vaccinated a little bit earlier, uh, up to four days earlier. Uh, I've had both bells. Okay, so, you know, for people who are at risk of the um, demonstrated or the side effects that have been observed, uh, you need to talk to your doctor. 
and really discuss the risks and benefits of the vaccine versus not getting the vaccine. If you're at a very low risk of um, developing COVID, getting COVID as well as developing severe disease, um, but you have severe you know, risks as far as side effects, then it would be a different decision as compared to someone who is at higher risk of um, developing COVID. Would you add anything to that, Lee? No, I think I think that's that's good, and and a lot of the benefits are really um, would I get sicker from the vaccine and have lasting side effects versus would I get sicker, uh, potentially be hospitalized or potentially die if I get COVID. I mean, in, in right. very blunt terms, that's essentially yeah. the risk benefit discussion. And there's a question about anaphylaxis. For so for anaphylaxis, um, the decision decision that was made is, you know, they, they don't want to contraindicate it because they want to give people who are at high risk the opportunity of getting vaccinated. But again, you need to talk to your physician and just weigh the risks and benefits. Um, there will be a longer observation period after, for individuals who have a history of anaphylaxis and they will have um, medications on hand uh, as well as emergency options uh, for individuals that may have severe side effects. So those, um, they're anticipating having to handle those cases if they arise. Correct. And the, um, there's a, a, a screening questionnaire that CDC has put out that the hospitals are using and that uh, will also be used in all of the state and city or county uh, sponsored uh, point of distributions. Um, and so, um, the kind of the simple messaging is if you have had a severe allergy or anaphylaxis from any reason other than to a component of either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, you may still, you know, get the vaccine. You're going to be monitored for 30 minutes. And in general, if you're supposed to be carrying an EpiPen around with you all the time anyway, you should, you know, bring your EpiPen. But as Dr. Chang mentioned, uh, there, there will be epinephrine and Benadryl and other things uh, in case. And uh, so far, all of the cases of, of anaphylaxis or even uh, kind of severe vasovagal or other types of things, again, very, very rare, but they've all occurred kind of within that 30 minute period, uh, mostly within 20 minutes, which is why uh, the ACIP has recommended, you know, 30 minutes of monitoring for those with a history of severe um, allergic reactions. And so this includes people with severe drug reactions as well, Cipro, Flagyl, Sulfa, et cetera. Um, yeah. So there's a question about mutations and um, are they gonna be checking to see what strain people who become positive have? So within the vaccine studies that are gonna continue on for the next, for, for the full two years, they are sequencing all of the strains in vaccine groups that break breakthrough infections. Okay, so they are following up on that. Um, there may be studies that are carried out for the general population uh, by different groups, but it's not gonna be done routinely. Okay, um, do both these vaccines protect against various strains? As far as we, as far as we know, uh, they protect against all strains of COVID, um, but you know, <laughs> science is evolving and uh, we're, it's going to be a little bit of time before we can say that with certainty that you know all the variants out there are protected against. Uh, will the ongoing trials help to figure out the length of immunity? Yes. Um, so within the trial they will be doing serological monitoring as well as continuing to test for both seroconversion as well as infection. So we will know within the two year window um, whether the, the length of immunity is at least two years. Beyond that, I think um, is not within the study itself. Uh, the CDC recommends previously, yes. Uh, yes, so, so for this question, and then this will be the last one we'll, we'll do right now. And then I'll, this kind of is a nice lead in. I think into the <clears throat> prioritization allocation of logistics. So the question is that CDC recommends vaccinating um, people who have had COVID-19 and what is the rationale, especially 
uh, in the first round of vaccination when we know there's a shortage or insufficient uh, vaccine to meet the supply. So again, it's really if you are in the 1A or 1B category, which I'll go through next. Uh, and if you had COVID, but it was more than three months ago, right? So, so the generally accepted uh, and evidence with, with the different antibody studies and whatnot is that if you had COVID infection that was severe enough to land you in the hospital, okay, then you're generally immune, thought to be immune for 90 days, okay? So, um, but there may be in fact, people who are uh, very, very high risk uh, for, <clears throat> for developing, you know, complications again. I mean, there's a very rare reports of people who have gotten reinfected. Um, and so, but the rationale and the, the formal recommendation is again, discuss it with your provider. But if you had it, but it was more than three months ago, we just don't know, right, how long that immunity lasts. And so if you are in that high priority group, then they say go ahead and, and get the vaccine. Okay, so um, you can keep your questions coming in the chat, but I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, share, share my screen. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, some of those decisions about prioritization, allocation and logistics. Uh, and so I'm uh, on numerous vaccine implementation plan uh, committees. Uh, and a member actually of the prioritization and allocation work group and several others, including the medical advisory committee. Uh, and I've also been involved uh, with the state's COVID response since uh, early April. So there are generally thought in, in the vaccine plans that have been developed by the country and the state, there are essentially three operational phases. Uh, so phase one is when there's potentially limited doses available. Uh, phase two is when there's a larger number of doses available. And phase three is when we have lots and lots of doses available. So phase one started uh, for us here in Hawaii on December 15th, actually really started for the country uh, December 14th and 15th because that's when, because Pfizer started shipping uh, their supplies as soon as the EUA was granted. And then once the CDC ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, once the ACIP gave the formal approval, then that's when you could have shots in arms. And so as Dr. Chang mentioned uh, in a very early slide, the reason that we're actually able uh, to get any vaccine out of this you know, quickly after emergency use authorization is that the significant investment was made uh, and, a, and a big gamble really uh, to produce this vaccine in millions and millions of doses before, uh, before the, the, the trials, the, the two months of the trials were done. Nevertheless, there's still you know, not, not quite enough for all 260 million uh, people in the United States, hence the phased approach. So uh, this is just a, a quick timeline uh, in case um, in case you haven't been keeping up, it's hard to keep up actually, but this just represents the last month, uh, which again is truly warp speed, uh, which is why it's called Operation Warp Speed. So Pfizer and Moderna both submitted their application uh, in, in you know, November 20th and November 30th. Uh, the CDC ACIP met to discuss the phase 1A on December 1st. Uh, and then between December 10th and 12th, the Pfizer vaccine was approved uh, by both the FDA and the CDC. Uh, and then the week, that week later, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we started receiving our first shipments here in Hawaii. Uh, we also had an exercise at Leeward Community College um, to, uh, to, to kind of practice and make sure we had the operational plans uh, for the first responder vaccines uh, vaccination. And then this past weekend was also, again, a busy one, as you just heard. So with the whole idea of a phase allocation is that there are general core principles uh, that the CDC and the National Academies of Medicine, uh, many, many, many people have been working on uh, for months to make sure that, uh, you know, there's, again, equitable distribution 
Uh, and so some of the goals of the overall the CDC ACIP working group was to make sure that the vaccine was safe and effective. And Dr. Chen uh, just reviewed some of that information. Uh, and then really try to balance you know, and reduce the transmission, morbidity and mortality of the disease. Uh, and then very importantly, to minimize disruption to society and economy, including maintaining healthcare capacity. And you know, on the mainland, right, uh, numerous reports the hospitals on the mainland are overwhelmed. Uh, we, we as a, as a country overall, have have hit the tipping point uh, for uh, for hospital and ICU beds. We are very fortunate here in Hawaii that we are not there. We are one of the very few states. But uh, as we saw in August, uh, it doesn't take much for our hospitals uh, to be overwhelmed again, and we really don't want to see that. And so that uh, minimizing disruption and making sure we have a stable health care um, to, to provide care for people, not just with COVID, but like for the rest of the people is actually really important. And then again, ensuring equity uh, in the allocation and distribution. And so it's a fine balancing act. And, and these were some of the guiding principles that uh, the ACPIP used. So again, safety is paramount. Uh, and then the clinical trials. So Dr. Chang did a wonderful job summarizing, uh, you know, geez, 120 plus pages each uh, of data that was made available publicly. Uh, and uh, but but both uh, Pfizer and Moderna uh, really did their best to try to include participants, not just ethnicity. Now we know here in Hawaii. Right, we 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 always have our native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations, and proportionally, uh, you know, they're small, right, compared to uh, compared to the other minority, uh, large minority groups. And nevertheless, uh, they really did their best to try to uh, include uh, minority groups who have already demonstrated a very high risk, uh, both for illness and hospitalization and death, uh, and also age. We saw the age stratification uh, and also frontline uh, providers. So they, they, the both companies really did try to be as inclusive as possible. And then the efficient distribution and the flexibility is kind of where, where we are now. And so at this most recent meeting uh, on the 19th, uh, so that's just two, two days ago, um, the work group considered uh, really the balancing act of preventing morbidity and mortality uh, and also preserving societal functioning. And so the phase 1A is really our long-term care facility residents and healthcare personnel. Now in Hawaii, we have a very unique situation in that most of our uh, adults and elders uh, and, and frail, um, ill, developmentally disabled, they actually don't reside in long-term care facilities. We have a huge number that are in community care homes and um, adult residential care homes and, and foster care. Uh, and so that poses some additional logistical challenges for us, but that whole group uh, is included in the 1A for Hawaii. Uh, so 1B now is the new recommendation is persons over 75, but also frontline essential workers. And 1C, I know you can't see it here, but it's better on other slides. Again, this is straight off of the CDC, but they further prioritize and, and shifted between uh, 1B and 1C. Again, and all of this was to try to balance, do that very difficult uh, balancing act of preserving societal functioning and keeping us safe. So this grid, I know it may be hard to read, but this comes straight uh, from the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine report, uh, which was a you know, framework for equitable allocation of vaccine. Um, and uh, many of us here from uh, UH uh, had the opportunity to weigh in on that and provide public comment, especially as relates to our native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders and, and Filipino communities. And so, um, you know, a, a lot of those considerations made it into the uh, final report. Like they actually mentioned Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians, which was great because the initial version had very little mention. At any rate, it, the start areas are, uh, again, first responders and 
uh, teachers, critical workers in high-risk settings, and staff who work in these high-risk settings, as well as workers in industries and occupations that are important to the functioning society. So again, this was the National Academies framework, which came out several months before, you know, before the, the actual vaccine data. So this is the um, definition of critical infrastructure workers, and it's a huge, huge list. Um, and the federal government intentionally made it very overall inclusive, um, but it's really up to each jurisdiction in each state, uh, and then even in which county to, to really truly identify. And so there's this whole process of uh, prioritization and sub-prioritization um, that has actually been going on for a month. And so just to put a, a framework, so uh, this is the US data and then I'll show you the Hawaii data and then we'll understand kind of why uh, we have to sub-prioritize um, at least for this uh, initial phase one. So the essential workers um, as defined by, by the, the feds in that previous slide, uh, totals, you know, over 85 million people. But you can see the list of frontline essential workers. Uh, so it's our first responders, but also teachers and educators, but food and ag manufacturing and many others. And then there's other essential workers, uh, transportation, logistics, food services, shelter, housing, energy, right? This is again, many. Um, and so Hawaii uses this same list as well. Our numbers look a little bit different, but it's basically half of Hawaii's population. So again, we don't have, uh, you know, 500,000 doses of vaccine uh, scheduled to arrive in the next two weeks. So with the ACIP, their December 1st meeting uh, was to relook at everything. And really, they just focused on the phase 1A. Um, and then, it, you know, just yesterday or two days ago, they adjusted slightly the phase 1 B and phase 1C. And so this is the newest uh, as of the 19th, so I guess that's Saturday. Uh, lose track of time, Dr. Chang and I and Dr. Hankins, we've been on call all weekend, so sorry for the <clears throat> date confusion. But this is the latest um, allocation uh, diagram from the CDC. Uh, and the, the lighter blue uh, healthcare providers, long care facilities, that's phase 1A. So that's what has already started uh, and will be continuing throughout January and, and February. Now it's important to note that the phases are not necessarily sequential. So depending on the timing, the state is anticipating that phase 1B will start before phase 1A is finished. But since we just started phase 1A five days ago, and since we're just received the Moderna vaccine today, uh, we, you know, the state and the counties are going to need some time to uh, kind of get over that first hump uh, and, you know, work out any kind of challenges with logistics or, or other operational considerations. Um, and then we'll decide about, you know, kind of when we can start to move into phase 1B. But it shouldn't be March. Uh, again, there's every intention of trying to start, and most likely it'll be you know later January or February. We will just have to see. Um, but phase one B now again, according to the CDC, is the frontline workers who also have high risk conditions. So if you see, this is a multiple round Venn diagrams, and it's also rectangles that are also supposed to kind of be Venn diagrams. And so uh, phase one B is. As you've got frontline workers, you've got people uh, also, you know, there may be frontline workers who are younger than 65, but who have three or more comorbidities. And, and so that's kind of how they've encouraged us to think about it. But phase 1B definitely includes this bar of over 75. And that tracks with, with Hawaii as well, right? We want to protect our kupuna uh, because of we our own our own population, um, our own data about COVID uh, morbidity and mortality and hospitalizations are, are tracking a, across the country. Okay, so there's been a lot of studies now to to uh, to look at it. You know, we've been uh, doing COVID since March, and there is a, a bunch of national uh, databases that include not just the incidence and the mortality, which is kind of what we see in the papers, uh, but really including hospital data and many other things. Uh, and uh, when when we uh, 
when we make this uh, recording available, uh, Dr. Chang and I will, will combine our slides into a PDF, and I will also include the slides from the CDC uh, so that uh, you can, you know, kind of have the, the source slides. Um, but this is just a quick summary of the factors that impacted the modeling and therefore the ACIP recommendations. And I'll say that uh, in, in our Hawaii prioritization and allocation group, this also tracks with our, our last meeting prior to the ACPI meet, ACIP meeting. Um, and the committee actually did submit public comment uh, to the ACIP uh, on, on, uh, on Friday night. Um, in, in time for the public comment period. And again, so it, it tracks. So what the what the Hawaii Prioritization and Allocation Work Group is trying to balance really tracks with what the CDC is doing, has done. Okay. Uh, and so again, there have been a lot of really brilliant uh, minds and modelers uh, working across the country as well as here in Hawaii. Uh, and some of them are on the call, so thanks to all of you. Uh, but there, there's there's a lot of uh, great work that's been going on. And so essentially, again, it's it's you know by vaccinating the older adults first, uh, it does uh, decrease a little bit, right, the amount of deaths. Uh, and vaccinating the younger adults who have high risk conditions, so again, they're essential workers, or they're younger adults with high risk conditions, actually reduces you know some infections. Um, now, the, the biggest driver of the impact is going to be the timing of the vaccine in relation to the increase in COVID-19 cases. So that's a mouthful. But what it means is that in order for, for this to really make a huge impact, we all have to do our part. So as Dr. Chang mentioned, uh, we're all going to need to continue these non-pharmacologic interventions really for months. Um, because we need to get 60 to 70% of the population vaccinated um, before we can you know, be comfortable about saying that there is herd immunity. So that's a huge lift. In Hawaii, that may mean 20,000 doses of vaccine per week for 12 weeks. Okay, so those are again, very mind boggling numbers. And so until we get there, we're all gonna have to continue to do our part with the mask and physical distancing. Okay, uh, and then like everything else, the science continues to evolve and change. So the models will change over time as well as we get more experience as a country uh, with actually doing a vaccine. Okay, so these are kind of the sub-prioritization uh, considerations, uh, basically the risk of acquiring infection versus the risk of a severe illness or the risk of societal impact, and then the risk of spread. And so uh, there's a lot of words here, uh, but again, you'll have a copy of the slide, but these are the general sub-prioritization considerations. And why here in Hawaii we really have to do this is because if you just look at the essential workers, 541,000, so again, almost half, just about half of Hawaii's population. Our first shipments of vaccines, the first orders, uh, which are expected to arrive kind of ho hopefully by the end of December or at least early January is 81,000 doses. And so Hawaii, like the rest of the states, are highly dependent on the weekly shipments of the vaccine. Uh, and so um, we are not going to, you know, have 500,000 doses right, in, in, to, to do 1D. Uh, and so that's why, you know, additional guidance uh, is being developed for employers. This is just a, a quick, again, I know you can't really see it well, but these are just examples of community essential functions. So I will note that relevant to us here at UH, education is a critical infrastructure, but we know that within UH, some of us are uh, at higher risk. Perhaps we cannot do physical distancing, perhaps we're in labs um, and cannot do you know, completely online learning. Um, many of us here, here at Jobsum and our, we have colleagues from the School of Nursing and Social Work are, are in clinical settings, right? Um, but there are others that have, uh, you know, very, very specialized functions. Um, other things outside of Jabsum might be uh, the people next door at the docks and the crane operators that give us our toilet paper and everything else that we depend on. Right? If there's only 10 of them and um, they, uh, you know, one, one person uh, gets COVID, 
and exposes three or four others, uh, then now they're out for 14 days. And you might imagine what might happen to our toilet paper supply. And also too, as, as Jeremy put into the chat, um, many of our essential workers in stores and others. Okay, uh, and but we're not mandating the vaccine at this point. I'll comment on that at, at the end. So other considerations that factor in is the feasibility. How are we going to get these vaccines out to people or shots in arms as you may start to hear more and more? Um, you know, so for the elderly um, and, and uh, those in the long-term care uh, foster homes and others, you know, the transportations are a real, a real challenge, right? Um, and so the logistics are being planned around that. Same with the essential workers. Many may be in, in rural. Like neighbor island, how things look on a neighbor island are going to be very different than on Oahu. Um, many of our essential workers work in shift, yet the vaccine pods or the availability may be during kind of typical daytime working hours, right? And then we have a huge, huge, huge group with uh, high risk uh, medical conditions. And so, um, and for employers, you know, it's uh, we have to respect private privacy. Right, confidentiality, HIPAA, and all those kinds of things. So again, a lot of discussions about how to how to really operationalize this. The good news is that in studies and surveys being done here in Hawaii as well as across uh, the country, uh, there's good public support for this uh, this prioritization. All right. Um, and then ethics have to be balanced. Uh, and so this, uh, again, comes straight from the CDC slides. But with the older adults really trying to reduce morbidity and mortality um, and, and but make sure that we're doing specific outreach right to those groups. And so AARP and representatives from um, the elderly and the disabled communities are actually part of the vaccine planning so that we can make sure that these considerations are taken into account. Similarly, uh, we have representatives from racial and ethnic minority groups uh, in many aspects, actually many working groups, uh, because we want to make sure that the, the state wants to make sure they're hearing uh, from these populations and, and making considerations into the, into the operational plans. So similarly with essential workers and the things that differentiates, you know, many of our essential workers do not have the luxury of being able to work from home. Um, and they may have high levels of interaction with the public or others. They come into places where somebody could refuse a mask and they really have very little power to do that, right? And so those are some of the things, again, that we need to make sure as a state uh, that, that we're factoring in. And then for the very large group of uh, adults uh, or persons 16 to 64 with high risk medical conditions, um, you know, which is half of the country. And again, for us here in Hawaii, at least half, maybe a little over half actually, uh, all of these things also have to be considered. Okay, and so this is just the summary of the work group considerations. And the big point is that, you know, again, like I mentioned, the phase one A, B, and C are not necessarily sequential, um, and it'll really be largely uh, driven by the vaccine supply that we get here. So this is the recommendation that uh, they just made. Uh, and the working group we will be meeting on Wednesday to further discuss this. Okay, so now what about jobs and right? So our residents are considered healthcare personnel um, and are being, you know, planned to be vaccinated. Some have already started being vaccine, vaccinated. Others will be vaccinated, you know, soon, uh, kind of within the context of the hospital. Uh, and each, each hospital and health system has to work out its own operational details. Remember, they are also having to prioritize, right? So I just urge everyone to, to be patient. Uh, residents and, you know, uh, health profession students that are in clinical settings are all part of 1A. And 1A may not finish until mid-February for the healthcare personnel. Um, and for the people in the long-term care setting, it may not finish until the end of February, right? So again, it's not sequential, but I just urge all of us to uh, to, to be patient because it really is uh, a very huge logistics and operational challenge uh, that literally changes every two hours. Um, and so this, but this is where, you know, what's coming for, for, for us here at, at UH and, and for the rest of the state is that every week uh, we will, the state will be getting numbers uh, of vaccines, the shipments, and there's constant data exchange 
uh, to then figure out how much vaccine are we going to get for a week, and then how many is going to go to which place, etc. Um, and then uh, the the state will be issuing some guidance to um, to the employers uh, very very soon, yeah, hopefully next week. Again, we're meeting on Wednesday, um, but just to help you know kind of factor in these considerations. And so um, and so we may be asking uh, for more information across the UH system uh, to help us. Uh, so again, we have to kind of wait for the state and framework, and then you know we may be uh, doing uh, some additional data gathering at, at, at UH. All right, and so some practical considerations and challenges. Again, we're only day five into this. Um, so like I mentioned, it really depends on the number of doses that we're gonna get. Um, the hospitals generally will get the Pfizer vaccine and the state and, and, and county pods, as well as the long-term care facilities, care homes, et cetera, will get the Moderna uh, just because of the ease of logistics you don't have to deal with ultra cold storage, et cetera. Uh, there is a pre-vaccination form. Um, the hospitals are doing their own consent forms. Uh, I think from the state level, it'll be a screening and assent form for the state and county pods. Uh, there will be, again, we have to make sure that there's space and all of this for the uh, administration and for the waiting time. There's a lot of data entry. Dr. Chang also mentioned a lot about the different monitoring uh, things. And so for the, the rest of us that, that are not affiliated with a hospital, but yet who may fall into 1A or 1B, uh, my, my basic message is that the state tuned. Um, all of our general numbers have been counted and submitted to the state and the UH uh, is working with the DOH to consider uh, several different uh, other options for points of dispensing. That's a pod is point of dispensing, basically where you're gonna get your vaccine. Um, and this would cover you know, our UHP clinical clinic staff. So again, the health providers, the physicians and the residents are kind of taken care of, um, but there's a lot of other folks you know, in our UHP clinics. Uh, we certainly have health profession students across all of our health profession schools who are not volunteer vaccinators. There's other first responders besides the city and county of Honolulu. Uh, we have folks in BSL-2 or higher labs, and we've got many other uh, UH essential workers who may be in the older categories. And so uh, just, again, just stay tuned. Um, and uh, we just have a few minutes for, for questions, uh, but I do see that uh, there's, there's some comments here. Uh, so let's see, we've got all the way to, okay, so starting with, um, with a good question. So the pediatric patient or the parents is strongly requesting for the vaccine. How do we respond? And Dr. Chang uh, mentioned that again, the Pfizer vaccine can only be used in people uh, age, uh, you know, 16 or older and Moderna is for 18. And so really children cannot receive the vaccine at this time and there will be more information um, and then there are uh, another question about encouraging them and worried about the potential long-term side effects. And that's a great question. I don't know, Dr. Chang, do you wanna um, address this question about the long-term, the lack of data with the long-term side effects? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's reasonable for people to be concerned, but it boils down to balancing the risk of getting COVID against the risk of the possibility of long-term effects as you would have for any vaccine. And so, you know, we know that there is a very real risk of getting severe illness and death from COVID-19. That's not a question. The risk of getting, you know, long-term side effects is a question. And so you just need to, you know, make your decisions accordingly. Great, thank you. Uh, and then there was a question about mandatory mandating the vaccine um, and, and actually another one about insurance. So first of all, the vaccines are free. Uh, the federal government is providing the vaccines for free. Uh, depending on where uh, it's vaccinated, your insurance may be, uh, you, you can bill. Uh, there are codes for billing the administration fee, uh, but at the moment, uh, really no one is planning to, to bill for that admin fee. Um, at this time. And so, but again, the, to have equitable distribution, they needed to make sure 
that the vaccine was free. Now, as far as the mandatory, uh, so at the moment, because these are both authorized under emergency use authorization, um, and, and because of the lack of uh, long-term data, like we talked about, um, there is no uh, uh, kind of intention from the federal government or from the state uh, to mandate the vaccine. Now, there have been some interesting uh, legal arguments, though, and a recent um, a kind of a briefing from the uh, EEOC and others uh, that could make the argument uh, as employers for mandating the vaccine. Um, and so we'll just, I think, have to see how it plays out. But at this moment in time, uh, we are not planning to make this uh, mandatory, but we're strongly encouraging it for sure. Uh, the question about the PBL faculty considered. So that's a great question. Uh, so again, education is part of that higher priority group. Uh, and so in that sense, yes, um, but we will probably have to prioritize those who are again, kind of in the, now PBL is small group, right? And so we, we do know that. And at the moment for the spring semester, uh, there's still physical distancing and wearing of masks and other kinds of things. Um, and so the education sector is considered, you know, higher priority, but there may be others that are of higher priority um, that, you know, may go first. Um, but again, we'll, we'll just have to see how that plays out. And then to uh, Dr. Kamaka's question, will Jabsum be offering both Pfizer and Moderna? So right now, Jabsum is not intending to, to sign up as a vaccine provider. So I know for those of us that are clinicians are like, well, providers, doctors always give shots. So for this particular COVID, there's a very specific definition of a vaccine provider. Um, and, and so UH is, is offering sites to help administer but in terms of the actual the ordering and the full responsibility and the data management, all that, where nobody in UH is going to be an actual vaccine provider. So what UH would be involved in are the state run or the county run pods, uh, which, which right now is Moderna. And so again, uh, it's likely that if you're not vaccinated in the hospital, then you more likely will be uh, vaccinated with Moderna. Now that oh, may change. That Go ahead. Truly, I think the pods, are the pods getting Pfizer and the nursing homes getting Moderna? No, the pods are getting Moderna. Okay. Yeah, because of the um, ultra cold, right? Because not all pods have ultra cold. All the okay. hospitals, well, most of the hospitals do have. So yeah, so the, the, the state and county pods uh, are targeted for Moderna and that's what the planning is around. Okay. So I know we're at 104. We still have 150 people on the call. Um, and, uh, but we have time for maybe one or two more questions and then, uh, yes. and then we'll close it out and then make this recording and the PowerPoints available. Yes. There's one question that we didn't get to and okay. that is um, naturally acquired oh, yes, thank immunity you. versus uh, vaccine induced immunity. Right. Yeah. And the, thinking based on the evidence is that the immunity to vaccination is more robust than immunity induced by infection and immunity in induced by infection is very variable you know especially for people who are asymptomatically infected or who have very mild symptoms uh, very often they don't even make an antibody response so I would say one against the other, the vaccine is more, a better bet. <laughs> Great. Great, and then the final question, how do we find out when you're eligible? That is the million dollar question. And um, we are continuing to work on it again in the prioritization allocation work group. Um, we have meetings at the UH system level uh, weekly to try to make sure that we're all on the same page. And so that's a long way of saying, I'm not sure but check your emails and uh, we will get the, as soon as the information is known, uh, we, will, we will make sure to communicate it across multiple channels. And so thank you so much uh, for staying on a little bit longer than 60 minutes. And thanks for your great questions. Uh, again, this will be uh, the recording and the slides will be made available and we'll send it out. We're actually gonna post it on the COVID-19, the Jepson COVID-19 webpage. So thank you, Dr. Chang, and thanks to You're welcome. all of you. And we have many, many, many on the call who've been very active in COVID and keeping us safe. 
So thank you everyone and happy holidays. <laughs>